Back when I was in high school, back in the 1980s, there was a popular song. Some of you will remember this song. It was by Phil Collins called A Land of Confusion. If you don't remember the song, you probably remember the video if you grew up in the 80s. The title of that song, A Land of Confusion, is an apt description not only of the time that we're going to look at in the Bible this morning, but also of our culture today, of our people today, of many of our lives as we walk into this room this morning. You'll remember that we've started looking here at the book of Zechariah, and it's important to kind of understand what Zechariah is doing. In fact, open your Bible to Zechariah 8 with me if you would. And remember what's happening in this book for a moment. For 70 years, the children of Israel had lived in captivity in Babylon. That alone was enough to confuse that generation. I mean, if you stop and think about that, they're God's people. These are the people that that God had promised the land to and that he promised he would watch over and protect. And, And because of their sin, and particularly because of their sin of idolatry, God had told them all the way back in Deuteronomy that if you continue doing these things and you don't listen to me, I'll send you into captivity. I'll send a foreign land to take you over. But when it happened... It actually absolutely baffled the Israelites. It absolutely baffled the people. And for 70 years, they lived separated from, uh, from everything they knew. They literally lived in a land of confusion, wondering, where is God? What is he doing? When are we going to get to go back? And finally, after many, many years, seven decades... God finally moves in the heart of a brand new king, of the Assyrian king, Cyrus, and he says, okay, let them go back. And there's a group of them that get very excited and very passionate. They're going, we, and they know when they get back, they've got to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And particularly, they need to rebuild the temple. That's the one place that the Jewish people had been given to worship. It was in their mind the place where God dwelt on earth. It was the place where they would go to meet him. They were passionate about it and excited. And so they come back to Jerusalem, and they immediately set out to start building. But then confusion comes. They bought into the idea that I hear a lot of Christians today buy into. And it was the idea that if I'm following God's will and I'm doing what he tells me to do, life will be easy. And at first, sometimes it is. They came back to the land and they immediately started setting out, laying out the foundations, cleaning up the rubble, but then the trouble came. They found that economically they were suffering a great deal that the city was in far worse condition than they had expected. Not only that, they were surrounded on every side by enemies. Uh, I think about that time that, that, that they were living in, and, and it finds, you know, it seems to me like a lot of what they were experiencing parallels a lot of our experiences in life. You think about that, they came back and, and the land felt very strange to them. Think about that. They came back, and in one sense, it felt like home. They were back where they were supposed to be. They were back where they were intended to be. But the land was desolate. It, it didn't feel. This land that had once flowed, in the, was using Bible language, with milk and honey, now you could hardly grow anything on it. It was dry. It was desolate. When we think of the nation of Israel today, what do we think of? We think of dry, almost desolate land. In fact, one of the things that the nation of Israel does and the Jewish people do to this day are trying to replant a forest in the middle of a desert. And by and large, they do that, by the way. But in Zechariah's day, it was desolated and it felt rather alien to them. That's the way the world feels to us at times. In one sense, this is our home. This is the only place that we've ever known. And yet, if you're a believer, you know this world isn't your home, and it feels like a very strange place. They found they were in a hostile land. The Syrians had done something that, and the Babylonians rather, had done something that that no other nation had really ever done before. When they would conquer a people, they would deport the bulk of their population But they would also import people. 
They would take people from other lands and put them in the land that they had just conquered. And what they were trying to do was create confusion. Create a situation where people didn't share common backgrounds, common experiences. And when they come back, what we see in Zechariah, what we see in this portion of the Old Testament, this very late portion, is the beginnings of what the New Testament will call the Samaritans. These are folks that, that, that Israel looks at and they're not exactly sure how to deal with them. All around them, there are people who are enemies who are opposing the very things that they believed in. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and Al Mohler got up and, and gave a, a wonderful, wonderful message about our culture and how it has changed. Many of you in this room can remember a time when the culture in America was very friendly towards the church. In fact, I'm old enough to remember the tail end of that period when there was sort of an agreement between the church and the culture to sort of mutually assist one another. In fact, the way Dr. Mueller said it was, there was a time in America when the culture did much of the work for us. There was a time where we would say, America had a very Christian foundation. We couldn't say that today. Today we look around and we find the very culture that we used to feel very at home in now feels very, very foreign. And by the way, that's okay. It was an anomaly what we lived in for a period of years. In fact, nowhere else in the history of the world have you ever seen quite that uh, relationship between the church and the culture as we did in a period of a brief few decades here in America. But that day's over and it will never come back. And people felt very alone and very hostile. In your own personal life, have you ever felt like I'm going through a time and it just seems like I'm surrounded by enemies? I'm just surrounded. And they may not be physical enemies, but I'm just going through a period of time when it seems like the whole world is against me. Nothing seems to be working out in my life. Every, and we feel like we're in the midst of a very hostile world. And on top of that, they had become confused about their purpose. They had forgotten why God had established them in the per first place. And what's happened is it's started to develop into a debate, a religious debate. You'll remember we've been looking last week at Zechariah chapter 7. And just to give you a real brief uh, picture of that, what happens is Zechariah, well, after, after they come back to the land, they start building the temple, and then they stop. And for 18 years, they don't do anything. The Israelites just stop the work completely. And finally, God raises up Haggai, the prophet Haggai, and he sends him to, to Israel, and begin, he begins to preach and begins to tell them, get back to work. And they start the work up. Three months after Haggai preached, Zechariah shows up. And Zechariah's job is to encourage them. And you'll remember in the first um, six chapters of this book, Zechariah comes along and he says, hey guys, God is with us. He is in our presence. God is working in our lives. And, and, and you've got to avoid some sin. You've got to avoid some things, but, but God is with us, and he's going to strengthen us, and he's got a plan. In fact, one of the most famous passages in all of the book of Zechariah is in that fourth chapter where, where, where God tells a Zerubbabel, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That is a wonderful verse to live by. Amen? It's not our human strength, it's not our might, it's not our power that accomplishes the things of God, but rather his spirit working in and through us. And the work's been going great. And between chapter 6 and chapter 7, there's a two-year period. And things are looking up. Have you ever had that moment in your life where after a long struggle, it seems like the clouds break you know, I can see clearly now. The rain has gone. Every, I, I, I can see all obstacles in my, you, okay, you get what I'm saying? Everything's kind of cleared up. You all wanted to sing that with me, but you were afraid that I would attempt to sing it. All right? And so, so all of the problems seem to be cleared up. The temple, when they walk by, they can see the outward structure. It's there. In fact, from the exterior, it probably looked like it was finished, but it would be another two years before it was done. And the people began to ask a question. 
What are we going to do when the temple's finished? Once again, confusion. Do we hold on to the old or do we do something new? They had been practicing for eight, for 80 some years now, almost 90 years. They had been practicing four fasts during the course of the year. And each one of those fasts was connected to a different moment in their history marking the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. I'll tell you more about those in a moment. But they come to Zechariah and they say, hey, in the fifth month, should we continue to practice the sacrifice? And what they're doing is coming to the prophet and saying, how about asking God what we ought to do? And you remember in chapter 7, God brings them into a time of intense uh, self-examination. Can I stop and say something to you? Very, uh, We're kind of in a different kind of service this morning. We didn't plan it that way. It's just happening that way. So I may go off course here every once in a while, but listen to me. Before you can have revival, before you can experience the move of God in your life, there must be a period of self-examination. Now, here's what our problem is in America at times. Here's what's the problem in my life and probably in your life as well. There are moments where we want God to move because we're living in a land of confusion. We're living in a land where we look around us in a situation in our life where we're having struggle figuring out what in the world God is doing. And we desperately want him to move, but we do not want to do the first step. And that is to take a hard look into our own hearts because when we do that, God's spirit begins to show us some things that we don't like. Amen? We don't want to go. If you're really in bad health and you know, I got to go to my doctor's checkup. Have you ever done this? I, I hate to admit this. I do this every time I get ready to go see Dr. Oliver. I try to lose 100 pounds in three days right before I go see Dr. Oliver. Why? Why? Well, because I don't want him to tell me the thing. Some, sometimes we come to church. I'm going to be honest with you. We have built the church in America to do this. We have built our services. Don't confront me. Don't tell me what's wrong. Tell me it's all good. Tell me everything's good. Don't make me look inside my own heart. But I'm going to say this to you honestly. If you ever want to experience God... You have to look inward first. So chapter 7, they come and say, hey, should we continue the fast? And God basically says three things to him. He says, number one, why were you fasting in the first place? Is it sincere? Are you doing the things you're doing out of an earnest, honest heart? Are you doing things because you're just going through the motions? I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of going through motions. I think in the church in America, we had to stop worrying about, did we stay on the order of service and start worrying of, am I sincerely seeking God? Is it sincere? Then he says, listen, the way you can know that your worship is sincere is it, did it change you? Remember that last week? He said, did you go out and did you pursue justice? Did it cause you to change your behavior? If it hasn't, well, something was wrong with your worship. If you walk in here this morning and you walk out the same way as you came in, you've missed worship. Let's be honest with you. This is about change. Think about it for a moment. If you went over to the car wash and you ran your car through the car wash and when you got out and you pulled out and you walked around and you looked at your car and it was still just as filthy and just as muddy as when you put it in, wouldn't you say to the guy that owns the car wash, hey man, you didn't do your job? Well, we walk in here in church and we walk out the same way, I'm going to say this to you. It's not because God didn't do his job. It's because somewhere along the line, we didn't respond. And so in chapter 7, God sort of gets in the face of the people and says, hey, before we talk about the mechanics of worship, let's talk about the heart of worship. Before we start talking about fasts and whether you should fast or whether you shouldn't fast, that's not really the issue. The issue is, is this thing really moving your heart? And if he left us there, that would be very bad, wouldn't it? But thank God, chapter 8 goes with chapter 7. 
It comes together because in chapter 8, God begins to turn his attention and he begins to give the people who are living in a very confused situation a word from him. In fact, it's very interesting to me as we read through this text here in a little bit, I want you to notice 17 times in this chapter alone, God refers himself as the Lord of hosts. 17 times. There there are 285 occurrences of that in the Old Testament, 53 alone in the book of Zechariah, but 17 times. And when when I first read through that chapter, when you see repetition in the Bible, often it means that that's marking sections, that's marking paragraphs. But that's not what God's doing. God is coming in chapter 8 and saying to the people, get your focus on me. Don't just worry about the mechanics of the worship. Know this about me. In fact, he says four things in this passage, in this section of Scripture, that I think are a very apt word for us who live in a land of confusion. For a confused generation, God says four things in this passage that are very important. The first thing that he does is in the first eight verses, he assures us of his faithfulness. Look what he says in in chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Let's read it, and then I'll come back and tell you about it. He says, And the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Hold men and old women shall again sit in the seats of Jer- streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of uh, of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness." I want to show you what God says in this passage. You'll notice that in in verse number two there, God refers to himself three times as being jealous. Now, that's very interesting. You might remember that he used that very same language back in chapter one, where he said, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. Now, you might remember several weeks ago, I told you that the word translated as jealous can be used in two ways. One, it can be used in a negative way. In fact, here in America, when we use the word jealous, we almost always use it in a negative sense. And what we mean by jealous typically is someone has something we want and we want to take it from them, you know? So, you know, you see this, uh, uh, you'll see this with uh, with young kids all the time. If, if a little boy scores more points than the other kid, then they'll get jealous of one another. Girls get jealous of each other all the time. Lord have mercy. Uh, If one girl buys the homecoming dress and another girl shows up with it, then it's a contest of who put the most war paint on. Y'all following me? And so we get jealous of one another. If someone gets a nicer fishing boat than we get, we, then we get jealous. If someone gets a new whatever, we get jealous. That's a negative sense. And by the Bible condemns that. The Bible teaches us to be content with the things we have. In the Bible, it speaks of several people that get jealous. For instance, Rachel envied her sister because she was able to give Jacob her, her children before Rachel was. And so there was a jealousy that happened there. In Genesis 37, 11, the Bible says that Joseph's brothers got jealous of him because of his relationship to his father. And so there's a negative sense. But, but when it's used of God, 
That same Hebrew word is used in a positive sense. And it refers to God's commitment to his own glory, which by the way, that's the only person God could ever be committed to their glory because he is the highest of all beings. He's not being selfish there. He's being realistic. He is the highest being in the universe whose else glory would he seek. But it also reminds us that he wants our complete and total devotion. Now that's because God loves us and he wants what's best. And he knows this. If we devote and commit our lives to anyone or anything above God, we're selling ourselves short. So when he's talking about I am a jealous God here, he's saying, I want your devotion because I ultimately want and know what is best for your life. And so he points out here that that he has been working. It is his jealousy that provoked him to discipline the nation of Israel. He loves them. He wants them to live right, which requires sometimes discipline. So, for those 70 years they're living in Jerusalem or in Babylon, he's not doing that because he's neglected his people or that he's forgotten his people or that he hates his people. God is simply saying, I'm disciplining you to move you in the direction that I want you to be. We have to do that every once in a while with our children. We have to discipline them, not out of hate, not of anger, but out of love. But it's also his jealousy, his devotion and commitment to his people that caused him to bring the people back. And so here they are. They're coming back. And God demonstrates his faithfulness in this passage. Look look at some of the things that God promises that he'll do for his people in this passage. In verse 3, he says that he would dwell in their presence. He said, I'm going to come back. And my presence that you had enjoyed for all of those years, I'm going to be there with you. He had showed that, by the way, in the early parts of the chapter. Remember when when Zechariah, back I think it's in chapter 4, has the vision of the riders on the horse and one of them is the angel of the Lord? It's a picture that God has come to dwell with us in the midst of our trouble. Isn't that good news? God is faithful so that no matter what we're going through in life, no matter how deep the valley, no matter how high the mountaintop, God is always with us. Amen? We, we, there are time, when we talk about God's presence, we use a, a couple of words that help to describe this. In one sense, God is present everywhere all the time. We refer to that as his omnipresence. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere present all the time. It means no matter where you go in this universe, God is equally present there. But there's another word that we use to describe our awareness of his presence, and that's called his manifest presence. That's those moments that we are aware that God is here in a very special way. A few moments ago in our worship time, I don't know about you, but I sense the very manifest presence of God moving in my own heart and in my own life. That's not because God is really more present. It's that we're more aware of his presence. God's saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to dwell in the city. But not only that, in in, in the end of that verse, he says, I'm also going to give you a brand new reputation. He says that from now on, you're going to be called the faithful city, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. He's like, he's like Israel had been utterly desolated by the Babylonians. Their reputation among the world had been ruined. Have you ever done that in your own life? Have you ever messed up so bad that you just think there's no way that anyone's ever going to have any respect for me? I blew it so bad, everybody's going to look down on me. That, that drives a lot of people out of church. That drives a lot of people away from God. I got good news for you. God says, I'll give you a new reputation. Amen? I'll change you. I'll transform you. I love one time they were interviewing Lou Holtz, and they asked Lou Holtz about the Notre Dame football team. They said, how are you doing this year, coach? And I love what he said. He said, we're not where we ought to be, and we're not where we want to be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. Isn't that true of our lives? 
We're not where we're going to be one of these days. We haven't been utterly and completely conformed to the image of Christ. There's some still things in my life. There's some rough edges. There's some, some attitudes and thoughts in my heart that aren't completely right. But you know what? God has changed my life. And if you're saved, he's changed your life. And here's what's beautiful about it. He gives us a new reputation. Now, in one sense, people might look and go, my, look at the change in that person. And they might admire that. Other people might go, look at that. That guy's a fanatic now. Don't worry about being called a fanatic. That's a good thing. He says in verses 4 and 5, he'll give them a renewed peace. He takes the two most vulnerable people in the society, the old and the young. And he says, the old will sit in the city of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When they had first come back into the land, and probably even in the day that Zechariah was writing it, old people wouldn't have sat outside their houses for fear of what might happen to them. Do you remember a day when you could leave your doors unlocked and, and not worry about anybody coming in and stealing it? Now, now I'm going to be honest with you. Where I grew up in Ohio... I won't say we left our doors open, <clears throat> but I remember many times we'd get ready to go to church, <clears throat> we'd leave the house, we'd leave our garage door up. <clears throat> Nobody's ever going to steal anything. Nobody's ever going to We knew everybody. You didn't worry about it. Now, in that same house, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to, you know, leave anything unlocked. If you're sitting there in the living room, you keep the door up. Why? Because we're vulnerable. The young you remember a day and age when people used to be able to let your kids go out and play all over the place? My, my mom used to send us out. If she knew half the stuff that she did, and mom, when you watch this on the DVD, just close your ears for a moment. If she knew half the stuff we did when she let us out of the house, she wouldn't have ever let us out of the house. But she let us run around. We used to go and play in the woods by ourselves with no helmets. Amen? No, nobody watched us. Why? Because we weren't afraid. You weren't afraid anybody going to kidnap you. What are you saying? There's a day in Jerusalem. By the way, in his day, kids wouldn't have played on the streets. They're dangerous. But he says there's going to be a time when there's going to be peace. And he promises them a renewed peace. He says, not like that, he's going to do what Everyone else thinks it's impossible. Do you notice in verse 6 how he says it? He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in the sight of God? When you read that phrase, it's a little bit confused. Here's what people were saying. People are looking at the promises of God that he had made before, by the former prophets, and they're looking at that, and the reason they think it's marvelous is they're sitting there. They're not, that's not a positive they're actually looking and going, that's utterly impossible. That is impossible for those promises to ever happen in our current situation. Have you ever got so mired down by your own problem that you can't see God? You can't see how God's ever going to deliver you out of it. You look at it and go, it'd be marvelous if he would, but it ain't ever going to happen. He says, just because you consider it too marvelous to be true, does that mean that it's impossible for God? <laughs> hey, God, we look at our problems and they become overwhelming. From God's perspective, they're minute. They're small. And he's reminding them, God is going to do in your life what it currently seems impossible to you. Amen? God, that's the business that God is in. Doing that which is utterly impossible. Not only that, in verse uh, 7 and 8, he reminds them that he will save his people. And it's tempting to read that almost as if it's an exclusive promise to the Jewish people. But the text won't allow that. Notice what he says in verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. Most Bible scholars, and I'll show you later in the context of this chapter, understand that that is a reference to the Gentile nations. In fact, he's going to explicitly say that later on in this chapter. I'll show it to you. He's reminding them that God is not only faithful to his people, but he's faithful to his promise. 
He is going to do what he said he was going to do. He has a purpose and a plan, which is to draw people from every tribe, nation, and tongue into his kingdom. That was his, that was his promise to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. And that's the thing he's been working for. So he reminds us that he is faithful. Listen to me. You walked in here this morning. You got a lot of problems. You're living in a land of confusion. Things don't seem like they're ever going to work out in your life. Know this church. God is faithful. Amen? You don't seem like you believe that. He's faithful. He's going to do what he said he'll do. He'll fulfill his promises in your life. So we've got to know that God is faithful. But that reminder of his faithful leads us to a second message. Look what he says in verses 9 through 11. In these verses, he reminds us that we also, while we remember and, and, and while we um, uh, uh, are assured of his faithfulness, we also have to be strong in the present. That the knowledge that God is going to be faithful should strengthen us and encourage us in the press. Look what he says in verses 9 through 11. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. He's going to repeat that command here in a few moments. He says, you who are in these days have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the, of the Lord of hosts was laid. The temple might be built. For before those days, there was no wage for man or any wage for beast. Neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or came in. For I set every man against his neighbor. God says, you know what it was like when you came back. There was trouble. There was difficulties. There were challenges. And, and these things didn't escape me. He says, these things came by my hand. I allowed them to occur. In other words, God is saying, I was in control the whole time. Then he says in verse 11, but now I will deal with the remnant of this people as in former days, declares the Lord of hosts. For there shall be sowing, in verse 12, the vine shall give its fruit and the ground shall give its produce and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And as you have been by a word of, been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hand be strong. Two times, in fact, in that, in that section, he marks the beginning and end of that section with that phrase, let your hand be strong. He comes back and he says, listen, you know, you know how hard it has been and you know my promise. It's been difficult. It's been a challenge, but I was in control and, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to turn your fortunes around and we'll talk more about that in just a second. But he says, you have a responsibility while that is occurring, and that is you must be strong. He comes back and he reminds them of all of the struggle. He goes back and says, you remember all of that. But keep this in mind. You have a responsibility. Be strong. That doesn't mean be strong in your own strength. That doesn't mean, you know, my, my dad used to say every once in a while, if you, <laughs> my dad was famous for, if you got hurt, if you did something, you were outside playing and you stubbed your toe, you know. I remember I'd be a little kid. I'd get sprained an ankle one day. I come walking back and I was crying. I was probably like six years old. I was crying. I walked around the corner of the garage. Dad, I hurt my ankle. My dad's advice was buck up. Buck up. What did he mean by that? Stop crying. He said to me all the time, How many of your dads ever said this? You stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Strengthen up. Now, he's not meaning dig down deep inside yourself and toughen up. When Matt was playing football, every once in a while, coach, he'd be getting his butt whipped. Now, I didn't do this too much in, in varsity ball, but, but when he was playing freshman jimmy, I'd walk down to the corner of the field and right by the fence. I'd say, Matt. He'd turn around and say, buck up. 
Tough it up, man. Suck it up. What were you saying? Dig down deep inside. Get tough. That is not what God is saying. God is never going to tell you in your own strength and in your own might, go out and fight. What he says to you, rely on me. When he says be strong, what he means is be strong in the Lord. How do I know that? Because back in an earlier chapter, he said it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. When we're facing the obstacles of life, it's not that we need to dig down deep into ourselves and find a hidden reserve of power, but rather we need to lean on God. We need to lean into his promises. We need to lean into his presence. We need to lean into his uh, uh, promises in our life, into his faithfulness. We are strong. We encounter the things of God, or uh, we, 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 we overcome the, the things of this world, rather, by leaning in and drawing our strength from the infinite reserves of God's omnipotence. Not our own strength but his strength, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. We look into a land of confusion. We look around the world. How are we ever going to survive? How are we ever going to get through this mess in the midst of our lives? Know that God is with you and he will strengthen you. I love Proverbs 55, uh, 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 that cannot be right because Proverbs does not have 50. This must be Isaiah chapter 55. It says, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. Whatever problem you have, cast it on God. Throw it on him. Toss it on to the, to God will take and he will bear your burden. He will empower you to get through this life. But you must lean into him. And then he comes down and he begins to sort of remind us about his covenant. He's actually already started to do that in the verses that I read. In verses 12 uh, down through verse number 13, he starts reminding them about um, the blessings. He says, as you've been a byword, verse 13, and a cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hand be strong. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord of hosts, as I purposed to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts, so again I have purposed in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear not. These are the things that you shall do. Now I want to stop and show you something. That verses are deeply ground in the covenant they are laid on the foundation that God of the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. Remember back in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and chapter 9, 29, God said, if you will do these things, if you'll obey my commandments, I'm going to bless you. There's blessings for obedience. And then in chapter 29, he says, here are the curses. But if you don't obey me, these are the things I'm going to do to you. That old covenant that Israel lived in was pro had blessings and cursings attached to it. God says, you've experienced that curse. You've experienced the negative side of that. You've experienced what happens when you're disobedient to me. But I'm going to now show you the blessings. But then look what he says. And this is important in verse 16. In fact, if you have your Bible, get ready, underline this. These are the things that you shall do. Remember this, church. God's blessings come with responsibilities. Uh, but it doesn't mean, because we live under the new covenant of the New Testament, we're saved by grace, right? But, but I want you to stop and think about this. Sometimes we miss that. We never can earn God's credit or earn God's favor by keeping the rules, you know. We don't earn his love or his affection by trying to be obedient to him. He gives that to us by his grace. Our salvation comes to us by grace through faith. But when we properly understand and respond to the gospel, we know that our faith results in, in works. That's why James says faith without works is dead. 
If you have faith but no works, your faith is shown to be false. Now, let me give you another example of that. Whoop, I lost my place. If you go back and, and look in the um, epistles, go back and read Romans. First ch seven chapters or so of Romans lays out the gospel. This is how you're made right with God. You are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But then in chapter 8 to the end of the book, he says, now, as a result of that transformation that the gospel has brought about in your life, here's how you live. You're going to do these things. Book of Galatians, first couple of chapters, first three chapters of the book, here's the gospel. You are saved by grace through faith, but it will result in a change in the way that you live. It'll change your relationships, amen? Amen. It'll change the way that you uh, function, the, the things you do, the things you participate in. So if we've truly experienced God's grace, it's going to transform us. That's what he's getting at here in, in, in Zechariah chapter 8. He says in verse 16, these are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath. For all these things I hate, declares the Lord. He goes right back to some of the things we talked about last week, and he talked about social justice. He talked about responsibilities. He says, you got to speak the truth to one another. The things you say to one another need to be truthful. Now, by the way, the New Testament says speak the truth in love. And I'm not always sure exactly how that's supposed to work out. But I know we're supposed to do it. You know? If, if someone says to you, how do I look today? And they look terrible. Speaking the truth in love doesn't mean you look horrible, buddy. If Cliff ever comes up to me and says, how do I look today? Well, I'm going to fire him, all right? Because... We ain't going to have any of that on my stuff. But, but if he did, and I look at him and I see that he's got, you know, big old booger hanging out of his nose. And I don't say, hey, Cliff, you might want to go in and check a mirror. I'm not speaking the truth in love. I need to find, if I just make fun of him for it, I'm not speaking the truth in love. But if I just let him go, I haven't done either. We need to learn how to speak to one another. We need to render true judgments that make for peace. Pursue justice, in other words. The word peace there is the word shalom. Shalom, we tend to think of as this greeting the Jews use together. And, and some people say, well, it just means hello. Shalom doesn't mean ho hello. It doesn't mean goodbye, necessarily. It means peace. And peace is not just like hippie, peace, brother. He's... Peace means doing that which is most beneficial for the other person. So he's reminding us that in justice and judgments, we need to do that which is right and good. Now, what does that have to do with us? Again, that is our responsibility. As a response to God's grace, we need to make sure that we are living out our responsibilities, that we are taking a careful examination of our hearts you want to experience God. You want to walk out of here transformed. It's not just to get about the emotions of getting psyched up and hyped up. It's about hearing the word of God, hearing the voice of God, hearing him say to us, here's where you're out of step with me, and then stepping back in. Otherwise, we hurt ourselves. My son Matt and I were over at the gym here a few weeks ago, and uh, we were working out. And we had started to do a new exercise that we hadn't done. I won't say it's a new exercise, but it's one we hadn't been doing. We were going to squat. Some of you know what that means. We're going to squat. I had squatted in a long, long time. Guys my size generally don't like to squat. And so we went in there, and I said, Matt, when I do this, watch me carefully. Watch my back. Watch my hips. Make sure I'm doing this correctly because you can hurt yourself you can pull something and i'm gonna be honest with you guy my size pulls something at planet fitness they're gonna have to tear the back wall out to get me out of there all right so so i'm saying watch my form when i got done matt looked at me and said dad when you went down your back arched just a little bit this happened on the next one i made adjustments why did i do that well, because in the process of trying to exercise, I don't want to hurt myself. 
And doing things the right way with the right form is a key. God looks at us when we're here at church and he says, okay, this is where your form is a little bit messed up. These are the places in your life where you're a little out of step with me or even a lot out of step with me. And he's telling us, move that, change that, adjust the way that you live. So he's reminding us of his covenant and our responsibility. And then there's a fourth thing that God does. And I love this. He closes out by pointing us towards his ultimate plan. In life, it's important to have the big picture in mind. Amen? To be able to see how do the parts fit in. It'll give you a deeper appreciation. I remember a number of years ago, I was sitting with Harry Edwards at his house. And we were talking about the war. Harry told me a great deal about his experience in World War II. And I was very, very honored and very humbled uh, by the fact that he trusted me enough to do that. And Harry was talking to me. Harry fought with the 4th Marine Division in World War II. Historic. They made some of the most historic landings in the Pacific. And he was telling me, well, we left... San Diego, and we went to here, and then we went to here, and then we went to here. He was in the Battle of Saipan. One of the great turning points, one of the forgotten turning points of World War II. Had we not been able to take the island of Saipan, we would not have been able to use bombers to reach mainland, or not mainland, but the island of Japan. It was a very important, very strategic spot set up later for the attacks in other parts of that of, of the uh, islands in the Pacific. And I said to him, Harry, you were involved in one of the most historic battles that the United States Marine Corps has ever fought. You were in the battle that turned a lot of the tide of the Pacific conflict. That was a historic battle. And he said, Why? He had never thought about what he had done in the scope of the large picture of the war. He was just doing his job. As we sat there and we talked about the strategic importance of that particular place and why it was so important, his understanding that what he had done was not just average, it was momentous. He was just doing his job. He was just doing what he had done every day he had ever been a Marine. He hadn't thought of the importance of what he was doing in the grand scope of the war. That's what happens to us as believers. I often say that the the momentous, when it is happening, feels mundane. The guys that are involved in something historic don't generally know its history while it's going on. They didn't realize that this was as big as it is until they can look back over the course of history and go, man, that was important. that's what happened to Harry. Harry was doing, and, I, and I'll be careful how I say this, okay, because I mean this with all respect. He was doing the monotonous work of a soldier and unaware that what he was doing was absolutely momentous. Church. There are so many things we do in life that feel so mundane. I got to get up and read my Bible again. I got to pray again. I got to go to church again. I'm just a cog in the wheel. But what you're involved in is absolutely momentous. And God reminds the people of Judah of his great plan. He says, let me, under, let, me, let me share with you that what you're doing is part of something so much bigger than you can ever imagine. Every once in a while, without putting words in Cliff's mouth, I'm, I'm pretty sure we have the same experience. There's a lot of things that go on in our church that just feel like routine. He plans mission trips. He's a robot when it comes to planning mission trips anymore. We got a plan. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And there's a reason why you do this and you do this and you do this. See, sometimes we like to freelance. And freelance kind of gets us in trouble. 
There's a plan. There's a way that, 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 that things have worked and, and, and that follow the plan. And sometimes it feels like all I'm doing is making phone calls and I'm making reservations and I'm setting things up and I'm just going through. It's very mundane. But if you were to look at it from heaven's perspective, that mundane work that just seems like, huh, it's so minor, takes on renewed importance. What he says here, verse number 18, and the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth month and the fast of the seventh month and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. He comes back to the very thing that they'd ask him about. God, should we have this fast? God says, yes. But that fast is going to take on new meaning. That fast that had been marked with mourning, that had marked four of the most terrible events in the history of the nation of Israel, we're now going to take on joy. Why? Because in light of what God is doing now, in light of his big purpose, you can see how that disaster, how that moment of mourning, how that sickness, how that moment of death, how that moment of hardship worked into God's ultimate plan, and you can celebrate it. I'm convinced that's what happens in heaven. We understand that God wipes away all tears and wipes away all that, but I don't think God does this. I don't think God walks up to us. Do you guys remember the movie Man in Black? Remember, you don't watch Will Smith movies? What is wrong with you? All right. Will Smith, and they would walk up and they would hold some kind of little beam up and they would hold it in front of the, and it make them forget what had happened when they met the aliens. Y'all following me? They take the memory away. And sometimes I think we get this idea when we get to heaven, God is going to take away all of our mourning and all, because he's going to wave a wand in front of us and all the bad memories will come out. I'm not sure that's what's going to happen. I rather believe that when in heaven and we can see the grand scope of all that is happening and all that God has done, all of our suffering and all of our mistakes and all of the terrible things that we experienced in this life will all finally make sense. Amen? I really don't think in heaven, sometimes we get this idea, people say to me every once in a while, why did that happen? You know, I have to tell them very often, I don't know. I don't know why it happened. And I'll say to them, You'll have to wait till you get to heaven. But in heaven, I don't know that it'll really matter. I'm not sure if I wouldn't revise that statement after I've been thinking about it this week. It's not that it won't matter. It's finally going to fit. You're going to be able to look and go, in light of all that God has done, in light of all the glory that I'm experiencing, that moment makes perfect sense now. Have you ever had that experience? Someone tells you, wait, before you do that, you need to do this. And it doesn't make any sense to you. I'd work with my dad on stuff. My dad would say, wait a minute, we have to do this first. I never get one time. I know I'm running long. I'll take it off tonight, okay? I'll give it back to you this evening. Listen to me real careful. This is important. I used to work with my dad every once in a while. My dad, one time we were refixing our, we had bought this old church building, our church did, and we were remodeling it. We didn't have the money to build a facility like this, so we bought an old building that had been uninhabited for several years. And almost every water pipe in that place was broke. And my dad, I don't know how my dad did this, but my dad collected copper fittings for pipes. He always, you go, you go to a flea market and you'd be walking through, dad would be walking around with this box of, of, of pipe fittings. And you say, dad, why are you buying pipe fittings? He'd say, you never know when you're going to need one of these. We had all copper piping. Our house made sense now. A couple years ago, my mom had a problem with her toilet and I was up there and my brother went out and I, we found those old copper pipes. There's thousands of them. Couldn't find the one we needed. 
We went down to the old church building. My dad says, you work on that side. I'm going to work over here. Here's what you need to do. And he gave me instructions about how to solder those pipe fittings together. And I done mine. I, I, you know, put all the pipes together. We walked down to the end of the hall, and I, we got all of it done. And my dad went down. He said, okay, I'm going to go down. And, so you go down and turn the water on. I'm going to stand right here, and I'm going to watch for leaks. He only stood on my side of the building, by the way. Turned the water on. He didn't have a single leak on the pipe that he had. Every joint that I put leaked vociferously. Dad come back, and he said, what did you do? There's leaks all through these. He said, you know that water has to stay in the pipe. Yeah, Dad, I understand the, the purpose of what we're doing here. I said, okay, turn it back off. Let's take these apart. We took them apart. And I'll never forget, and I don't remember the whole details about exactly what he told me, but he walked through and he showed me exactly what he did. My dad was good at this. But he had a step. Step one, you do this. Step two, you do this. I was skipping one of the steps. I was convinced you just didn't have to do it that way. You see, that's the way God is sometimes. There's steps that has to go through our life. There's things that have to come in our life that we don't understand. That we don't comprehend. I don't know why it has to be that way. But God has a plan. And he's a wise and he's a good God. And if he's put it in our life, it's there for a purpose and for a reason. Now let me show you one last thing. He closes it up. I know, you're getting, you're getting antsy, right? you getting hungry? Getting hungry? Okay, don't worry. You're going to eat. I promise you. But first, you've got to hear this. Verse 20, thus says the Lord of hosts. He zooms out. He takes them away from their problem. He says, let me show you eternity. Stop thinking about your own little problem for a moment and just step back. Just let's go out here to the edge of space and let me show you the corridors of time. Let me show you what I'm going to do. Look what he says. He says, the inhabitants, he says, uh, peoples shall yet come. The word peoples there is a big hint that something huge is happening. The word peoples is a reference to the Gentiles, to the nations. He says, people shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. He says, there's going to be a day where people are coming and saying, I'm going to the house of God. Come with me. The Gentiles are going to be grabbing each other and saying, come to the house of God with me. Isn't it amazing? If you're a Jew, that had to seem like the most incredible idea you could possibly imagine. He says, many peoples, verse 22, and strong nations shall come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those den, 10 men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Do you know what he's painting a picture there of? He's painting a picture of the day that you and I live in. He's picturing what was going to start at the day of Pentecost when suddenly God would throw the gates open to the Gentile nations and he would say to them, come, turn to me, trust me. And there on that day of Pentecost, people from all over the Roman Empire, all over the known world at that time, were there in Jerusalem and they heard the gospel and they came to him. And then it happened as the church started to spread and Paul went from place to place and the other apostles went from place to place and Jew, Jews, some were coming but many, many more Gentiles. And we still live in that day. And he's reminding them, I have this great purpose. He's reminding them, this thing that happened to you this moment is going to result in my glory and people coming to know Jesus. One of my great heroes of the faith, and I'll close with this, was a guy named John Hayes. John was the first guy I heard the gospel from. You've heard me say that before. Later on, I took over the church and opened door after John retired. Greatest honor that I think I've ever had. And John got sick. He was dying with cancer. John was an old school Southern Baptist preacher. 
in the morning, he would get up and literally had pajama pants on, but he would put a, a shirt, a tie on, and lay in his bed. Just in case anybody come by to see him. He wanted to be prim. He wanted to be proper. And he got awful sick. And he knew his time was short. And I'll never forget one day. He said, Joe, God has a purpose in this. He led several of the nurses to Christ who were taking care of him. He was going through the hardest moments of his life, but he stepped back and he looked at it from eternity and he understood God has a purpose. Amen? God has a word to a confused generation. Know that I'm faithful. Know that I've made promises and I'm going to keep them. Know that I have a greater plan for what you're going through than you could possibly imagine. So step back and see it through my eyes. Would you stand? Would you bow? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you. Lord, we're running way over. But God, you're speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray just for these next few moments. Have your way. Have your will. If there's someone here struggling today with being able to see the big picture, help them to see it, Father. If there's anyone here today that hadn't been living up to responsibility, speak to their hearts, call them back to faithfulness. If there's anyone here today that doubts your hand upon them, show them your faithfulness. Come and minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.